Okay, folks, welcome back. This teaching is going to be specifically dealing with implementing the Asian range. All right, the Asian range. Notice it does not say ICT Asian range. I did not create this or author this concept. Um, my first introduction to it was from another trader, which I'll mention later on in the presentation. But what ICT concepts are going to be used in this module? We're going to be introducing the Asian range. We're going to be defining what the Asian range is in charts. And we're going to teach you how to utilize it in bullish conditions and how to utilize it in bearish conditions. All right, introducing the Asian range. Now, what is the Asian range? Well, the price action prior to the Frankfurt Open or London opening can be very indicative of the future intraday price movement. Now, when we have a directional bias, we can use this Asian range to build or frame a context or storyline to the market's likely intentions. There is a stillness in price many times right before the intraday directional impulse price swing. You look at the chart here on the right. This is an Aussie dollar chart. You can see that there is a little shaded area right in here. And it's delineated with the gray shaded box. And I've labeled it, not surprisingly, the Asian range. So this little piece of price action, okay, I actually learned about this from Chris Loring. And I'll show you what I was doing before I learned this. So that way you can see I already had a, a, a beat on what price should be doing. But when I first saw him refer to it in his free teachings, he has a uh, website, chrislaurie.com. Uh, it's changed and morphed a little bit over time. But uh, folks that have gone through his material that know who I'm referring to, uh, they would not in agreement that they would know what I'm saying is true. Uh, he taught about the Asian range many times in free teachings. So it's not like I'm taking anything away from him. Uh, in fact, uh, if you're not happy with what you see in my content, uh, but you do want to take some advice from someone that has seen a lot of things out there, Chris Laurie has a lot of uh, good price action study. And his methods, while they are not mine, uh, there's some similarities to what Chris does. But I'm going to show you what I took away from him. This is the only thing I really learned from Chris Laurie, really. Uh, but and, and that's not to diminish his importance as a teacher or what he knows. I'm just saying that this is what I gleaned from his material. Uh, I liked it because I was already familiar with using consolidations in certain periods of a, a trading 24-hour period. If you take certain ranges, you can do some really magical things with them. And I teach you that in the mentorship. And it goes well beyond what I've done in YouTube videos over the past couple of years. So what I liked about it was... I seen a lot of context right away when I seen how the, the range is applied to the chart. So I will give you what I used to do and how I used entry techniques to do it. So that way you have a little bit of a, uh, a takeaway, not only just talking about the range itself, but what we can do with it. And then I'll show you what I've done with it to uh, incorporate it. Now, I'm not teaching you everything I know about this range and what I've done with it over the last... Mm, 10 years or so, the, uh, the implementation of it, I think, is useful for a developing trader. But there has to be some context behind it. The range itself doesn't produce anything magical. But if you have a storyline behind what price should be doing that particular day, it is unbelievably helpful. Okay, so let's define the Asian range. What, what is it that we can do in our charts to make it appear and draw our attention to it? Well, the range begins at 7 p.m. New York time, and it ends at midnight New York time. Now, as a special uh, inclusion here, Chris Laurie had his Asian range pushed beyond midnight. And if, my, if memory serves me correct, I believe he had 12.30 a.m., and... To me, the financial markets really begin at midnight New York time. And it probably sounds pretty arrogant of a yank like me <laughs> being in the States. But uh, if you just study what I'm teaching you folks, you'll see right away what I'm telling you is the gospel uh, as it relates to intraday price action only. 
Now, everything else might be something different, but as far as intraday price action, I think I've cornered the market in intraday price action. So the height of the range is the highest high between 7 p.m. to midnight New York time to the lowest low between 7 p.m. and midnight New York time. The width of the range is obviously the duration of 7 p.m. to midnight New York time. So let's take a look at this chart here, and we'll get a little bit closer and zoom in on it. Okay, and we'll cover some points here. Now, right away, when you see this, it probably still doesn't give you any kind of insight, and that's fine. But I'm going to build on it and show you how useful it is. But we're going to build the model with specific buy and sell conditions later on in this video. But for now, take a look at what you see here. Okay, and kind of like burn this in your mind. Your focus should every single day be zeroed in on 7 p.m. New York and whatever that time is on your broker's platform, whatever your charting platform or package shows. Find out what time it is at 7 p.m. New York time and then find that same time on your charts. That's where you put a vertical line at and that begins the Asian session. And then five hours later, it'll be midnight in New York time. Put another vertical line in and there's your Asian range defined by the duration. The highest high and the lowest low is what we would use to frame out the range. Now, there's a lot of voodoo that you can do with this range. Okay, and again, I'm not teaching you here, but believe me, it can take you to the highest and the lowest pip of the day. There's some things you have to incorporate in that, and I teach that in the mentorship. But for now, I'm going to teach you a very simple approach to how to use this. And when you can filter out trades and not do anything that may end up taking a loss if you do otherwise. So let's take a closer look and remove all of the benefit of seeing the price action there. Okay, now we do have the benefit of hindsight, but nonetheless, I want to kind of build a, an understanding about what this range does, or at least my interpretation of it and how I was able to see right away the importance of utilizing it in my view on price action. During this range, what's actually happening is there's orders that are coming in and they're stacking up above the market and below the market relative to that range. And it's also building up a market sentiment. Now, this compression of market participation starts to build up closer and closer and closer until we get to midnight in New York. As soon as we cross over midnight time in New York, we are in fertile ground for price movement. We're going to assume that everyone in this listening audience is familiar with channels, okay, or trading ranges. The idea is above this range, there's going to be buy orders. Those buy orders are going to act as breakout artists, okay? In other words, they are not astute to know how to buy when it's a low price or technically oversold without the use of indicators. So they just want to be buying on strength. And there's really nothing inherently wrong about that if you know what you're looking for. But most traders don't know what they're looking for, and they just go in in a willy-nilly an entry based on breaking out above an old high. They'll buy that and view that as strength, and they'll put the stop loss rate below the low, which would be here. Short sellers would do the opposite. They would have their sell orders below this range. So any movement lower would hopefully put them in a short position, and they would take the other end of that range and put their protective buy stop. So buyers that want to break out above this consolidation are going to buy on a stop with a protective sell stop below the low. Short sellers want to sell on a stop and use a protective buy stop above the high. Okay, so the storyline is what are we going to do after midnight, which is this vertical line here, what's the storyline? Where are we going to go? My whole entire career has been based on understanding this phenomenon. And it's been a more or less a pursuit of excellence. So I want to know with the highest probability, which side are they going to work on? Okay. And what I mean by that is, are they going to try to put a specific party of traders, whether it be bullish or bearish, traders in on the wrong side right before London creates what? The higher low of the day. So the key is, 
and this is the takeaway so far in this, this is what should be written in your notes right now, is what you're looking for, what sets up the opportunity, if you will, for the particular trading day, is if we have a very narrow consolidated range between 7 p.m. and midnight, or what would be deemed as the Asian range. So if we have a very narrow consolidation there, that sets up a huge possibility of the algorithm going into a trending model. Okay, so in other words, without going into IPTA and teaching anything really about that, the market will seek the liquidity above or below this range with a premise that it's going to put them in the wrong side and then it'll go the other way for the remainder of the trading day. Okay, so let's take a look at how we can utilize it in a bullish condition. Now the periods when price is bullish, we can extend the Asian range high and low into the future. When price returns back to the Asian range high, we can anticipate institutional buying. So let's take a look at that as an example here. We're going to assume that we had an understanding or expectation, if you will, that the Aussie dollar was bullish for this particular day. Now, if you want to know what would lend well to coming to that conclusion of being bullish, if you look at the daily chart, you'll see that there was a reason for the Aussie dollar to reach up to a equal high. Okay, and you go down to a four hour or a one hour chart, you'll see also that it's obvious, you can see it. So far what we've shown in the teachings, in this series, it's been pretty obvious to know where the liquidity is. And that's what this whole day was reaching for, the buy stops above equal high. Now, again, I want to take off the Asian range and provide just a blank chart. Okay, and assume for a moment, pre my exposure, okay, to Asian range, this is what I used to do. Okay, this is how I actually traded, and I was doing this since 1994. So you'll appreciate, hopefully, the evolution, if you will, of my understanding about how this whole buying below the open when it's bullish or selling above the open when it's bearish, all those ideas came from this individual specific element that I'm going to show you now. I would have on my chart a list of all kinds of indicators. Okay, so I'm going to spare you all that. But if we just look at price actions you know, as a naked form of open, high, low, and close, it can be rather, well, confusing. But if you look for specific times of the day and specific generic concepts or characteristics that should manifest themselves, then there's a storyline that will start to develop, and you get this over the years. Many times it's referred to as tape reading. Many times it's referred to as gut feeling or just trader's intuition or just, as I call it, intuition and ex experience, if you will. Once you know what you're looking for, you wait for that scenario to unfold. So this is what I would have done. Without the Asian range, this is how I always traded the S&P, the bond market, and currency futures. I would get the opening price at midnight, okay? And that opening price is seen here, right there. And all I do is draw that opening price out all the way out until 11 o'clock in the morning, New York time. Now, the reason why I would draw it out to 11 o'clock in the morning, New York time is because that would be the end of the morning trend for the S&P 500, okay? So that there's a reason for that hour. It's not that I'm just pulling that number out of the air. It's also, very close to what was taught in the previous teaching, the London close. So that's what makes that London close scenario. It's the end of the AM trend on the stock market or equities market in the States. Also, it overlaps conveniently enough with the close of London trading. So there's a little bit of manipulation that goes on in there and some profit taking. So it creates an opportunity. But for opening range concepts, I draw it out to 11 o'clock in the morning, New York time, okay? So if we are looking for a bullish scenario, and I'm gonna just make the case that we would be expecting a higher Aussie dollar here, I wanna see price initially drop down below that opening price because I wanna be buying below the opening price. 
the understanding is, is I want to figure out what Larry Williams said he couldn't do as a teacher. I took it as a challenge as a student to that's what I'm going to look for. I'm going to figure that out. And this is what my interpretation of how to do that very thing was seen in price action. I would use the opening price, and as it dropped down, I would buy right there. Now, if I either did not have the guts to do that or I missed the opportunity, sometimes I would wait for a specific price. It wouldn't get there, and then it would take off. If I saw a reversal or potential reversal, I would look at the high Right, but right before the drop down. And here you can see there was a small little segment of price action right before that drop down. I would put a buy stop right there. Now, as I graduated in my understanding, I would look to get in as price was dropping down, but I'd also have this buy stop in place. Even if I was able to get in, many times price would sometimes snap me in and put me in on the buy stop and on my market order as price was dropping down. So in other words, what I was doing was I was waiting for price to drop down below this horizontal uh, line or trend line segment here. Okay, That's delineating the opening price at midnight New York time. The drop down below that, I'm hopefully trying to buy that. Now, as it starts to drop, my eye goes right here because now we're below the opening price. It may go lower and give me my ultimate price of entry. But it may not. So as soon as it starts to break down after midnight and it goes back, back down below the opening price, I immediately add a buy stop to half the position I want to trade at this point here. So in other words, if my full position down here was, say, 10 standard lots, I would go in with a buy stop at five standard lots right here. So that way, at worst case scenario, if I don't get my fill here and it reverses, if you will, and runs real quick for these highs, It'll put me in at least half the position I wanted to get on down here. So half of something is better than nothing. If I were able to put on the full position down here, I would still try to take this stop off if I get my full position on down here. Sometimes I wasn't able to do that. Now, the problem is in your mind is, okay, what happens if you put your full position down here and you're risking 2%? Well, I wasn't risking 2%. So I'm trading at 1%, 1.5%, and then this position here, if it fills me, I'm not over leveraged. Or if I do get 1.5% on here and this half here, it would technically put me over 2.5% risk, but I'm going to be more aggressive about trailing my initial stop loss up to try to pare that down to 2%. Okay, And that's really what I was doing. Now, let's contrast what I just did here with the implementation of the Asian range, and this is exactly where price would fill you with that buy stop being tripped. So now I, I would be long here. If I didn't get filled down here below the opening price at midnight, this would be where my buy stop would fill me and my stop loss would be below the low. And you can see I'd have to weather this retracement here and then eventually catch the move later on in the day. Now let's take this discussion back, the implementation of the Asian range, and I'll show you how I evolved and seen a much clearer view on price action using the range as I define it here. 7 o'clock p.m. New York time to midnight, 00, zero level, not like 12.30 or 1 o'clock in the morning, none of that stuff, exactly at midnight, okay? Because what we're banking on is the midnight opening price, that's what sets the algorithm. It goes through, it, it, it goes to a reset, if basically, if you, if you want to think of it like that. So if we're bullish, it's going to go below that opening price to seek liquidity and then go higher and spend the rest of the day going higher. When it's bearish, it'll go above the opening price at midnight to reach for liquidity and then move lower for several hours going into London close or New York open. So now let's take a look at what's actually going on with the implementation of the Asian range. Now we have a tight Asian range in here. Okay. And again, buy orders are above the range, sell orders are below, below the range. Price right after midnight does what? Goes up and taps the Asian range high. Now, you're saying, okay, well, it didn't go above it. Let your stop be there. And I guarantee you, the broker spread will open up wide enough to get that. And you'll be in long. And your stop loss, which will be right at that low, or just below it, will be tagged right there. Even though it reflects here, your broker, and this is what you sign up with when you open up your account, 
you are giving them permission to open the spreads up on you. Everybody makes this big complaint about, oh, well, they did this and they did that. You sign it and you agree to it. So when you see people online saying that they trade with three pip stop losses, that's not true. It's not accurate. And they are not doing it with live accounts because believe me, in-house funny money gains with the brokers would eat them up immediately. It would not happen. Okay. Um, I think personally with uh, a stop loss of anything less than 10 pips is just ludicrous. It's stupid. Okay. Because at least from a retail broker standpoint, you're inviting them to take your stop. It's just the way it is. You can argue with me and give me all kinds of track history and say, well, I'm trading with a five pip stop here and there. That's fine. Do it 10 years and see how many times you get burned. The point is, why offer yourself up on the altar for that sacrifice when there's better ways of doing it? You don't have to have less than 10 pip stop losses to do very well. We have an Asian range in here with the understanding or in this model, we're going to expect bullishness. Okay. And price starts to go up initially and comes back down and breaks the Asian range down here. So we take out the low on the Asian range that's been extended beyond midnight. That trips in sellers and it also knocks out individuals that would have been pulled in on a buy stop right at this level. So long holders are in and now they're out. Short holders are in now and their stop loss is above here or here. So they're taking both sides of the marketplace in and out and then the market takes off, goes higher. What we look for is this little movement right here. That movement is what sets the tone when we're bullish. We want to be buying there or we can do what I showed earlier. You can put a buy stop right here. If it gets filled, a contingent order that would be if I'm filled with your broker or cancel order basically. Um, if we have a parent contingent order suggesting they could buy on a stop, if that stop gets filled, if it happens, then we would place a sell stop below this low at some specific price level. And you could leave that in the marketplace and go to sleep and don't even worry about watching all this stuff. Okay, there's one way you can uh, apply a day trader's model and or enter with a long-term model, but using a day trader's approach to trading that whole entry. If you've missed this one, okay, and price starts to rally away, we have to have the storyline behind this example of being bullish. Otherwise, this could be an easy sell, as you'll see when we talk about when the conditions are bearish. But knowing where the market is most likely trying to go from a higher time frame standpoint is significant and crucial in utilization of the Asian range. Otherwise, you're just going to do things that aren't going to be profitable. So if we're bullish, we, we'd like to see this element here and then this here. No problem. We don't need to get that, and we don't need to be a part of this movie. Either. Okay, we'll wait for price to come back down and touch the Asian range high. Now, it does so here, but it's a little early, and then we do it again in the New York Open. So New York Open, we see price trading back to the Asian range high. Right there is where institutional buying is going to step in. Why are they doing that? Because the initial range that was set between 7 p.m. and midnight Midnight is when IPTA, the interbank price delivery algorithm, resets, and then it, it attacks open liquidity or the open float, which would be the orders above the Asian range and below the Asian range. And I already know you're going to know 15 different people that work at a bank or they know somebody they smoke cigars with on the weekends and they are a market maker. They're going to say, what I just said to you is nonsense, but I'm telling you <laughs> – they don't know what they're talking about because I'm doing this daily to the pip, week after week, day after day. And I'm telling you, it's not based on anything else except for what I learned. Okay. And some of the things are going to go in the category of tinfoil hat. And I'll just let you wrestle with that. I don't really care about your opinion. Just know that what I'm suggesting to you here, if you look at it in price action, it's there. So we can see the optimal trade entry. From this low to this high, retrace back down, New York open, overlap with the Asian range high. What the storyline is that we're bullish on the higher time frame. Beautiful illustration of a Asian range application in bullish conditions and then off to the races we go. So we have two opportunities in here in 
the New York Open. And we have one set up here that gives us a really, really low end um, entry point with very little risk in terms of our entry and then the subsequent move higher. The other portion would be entering on a stop here above the Asian range. But you wait. You have to sit up and you have to wait for price to drop down below the Asian range. Then you buy on a break above the Asian range high. But the conditions have to be bullish. And we have to first see Asian range low break. Then a buy stock can be placed at the Asian range high. If you do this before the Asian range low is taken, you will get burned. You will get stopped out. You will send me an email saying it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. I'm telling you there's rules here, and I just gave them to you. Rewind the video and re listen to it again. It's very clear. All right, so utilization of the Asian range in bearish conditions. Okay, again, like we said, but when it's bullish, there's a period that's quiet right before the Frankfurt and London Open. And we've been focusing on that. And when it's in a tight, narrow consolidation, we're going to be looking for some measure of manipulation, if you will, on price action. So what we're going to be doing is waiting for a break in the Asian range low. And then when price trades back up to it, we're going to be anticipating institutional selling. So let's take a closer look at this example here. Zoom in here, get some more detail. Now let this image burn in for a minute. Okay. And now we're going to take it off and go to an element of naked price action. And I'm going to show you what I was doing prior to learning about the Asian range. There's the opening price again. This candle. And I would be looking for bearish price movement. And if we're going to just suspend your disbelief whether or not I was actually bearish before this day or not, trust me and go through my Twitter. You'll see all kinds of examples of me doing this very thing. But nonetheless, we're going to assume for sake of argument that we're bearish on this particular currency that day. Okay, We're going to be looking for price movement above the opening price. That's what I'm looking for here. Okay. Now, I learned early on that these levels, these double tops, they were fake outs. And that's why I loved the turtle soup trading pattern that I learned in a book called Street Smarts. And if you don't have it, you should buy it. It's a very, very good book. But that pattern in there resonated with me because I was already doing things similar to that. And I would just look for those equal highs and equal lows, which I've already taught you in this series. And right away, there's a large number of you in our community that are just going through the roof right now with excitement because now you see something that's always been there, but now you see it and it's useful to you. You can see where price is drawn to. Well, if we see this time of day, and this is midnight, and we're bearish, we have equal highs in here. Right away, I want to know there's going to be a rally above the opening price, and I extend that out in time, about 11 o'clock in the morning, New York time, and any time price trades above that opening price, and it's inside of a kill zone. That means the uh, London or New York open kill zone. If it trades above that opening price, I will look to go short. Now, if we go above it, and this is what I was doing before I started incorporating the Asian range concept, I would just simply look for this rally above. If I got this scenario here, I was selling right there. I would sell short the S&P. I would sell short. Deutschmark, I would sell short the Swiss franc, I would sell the yen, all those uh, commodity futures contracts. That's what I would, that was my entry technique right there. And then I would go to sleep and wake up around five o'clock in the morning. Hopefully I'd get some profit and I would take something off, trail my stop loss really, really tight, sometimes get stopped out. Other times it would carry right on over into Globex, into open outcry in the pits. And then I would catch some more follow through in the day session hours in the New York session. But if that's my entry point there, just like anybody else, life may get in the way. Uh, I may get sick. Uh, my kids may be complaining about growing pains, and I can't be in front of my charts. You know, this happens. You know, I'm a dad. I'm I'm a husband. I own two. I'm a, I'm a pet parent. I own two boxers, and anything can happen. Okay, to distract me from actually getting in where I want to get in at. I don't always use limit orders. Uh, there are certain conditions where I want to use a limit order, um, but mainly I want to be executing right when the market's happening to be trading against my directional uh, 
bias for the day. I don't mind market orders. The folks that say you shouldn't be using market orders, you know, they should be using limit orders. Um, again, that goes along with not knowing what I do. I'm actually trading aggressively right as the market's screaming higher. I go marketing, selling short right then and there. And you've seen my examples. I mean, I'm getting in there right at the highs and or the very lows. So I don't care what anybody else's opinion is. I can do it over and over again. And I've repeatedly shown it week after week. If you are up in a week looking at London, you can use market orders. But if I am not going to be awake, I will put a limit order in about two pips above these equal highs. My limit order would be about there, and my stop also be about 35 to 40 pips. And I would go to sleep and be comfortable with that. Okay. Um, I would have an 80 pip take profit on the full position. That way, if I did wake up and it moved an accelerated pace and moved 80 pips, that would be five pips over my weekly objective, which is 75 pips. Um, I am always aiming for 50 to 75 pips only for a weekly objective. Once I do that, I'm done trading. I don't do anything else. But I leave myself the opportunity to catch a tiger by the tail. And if I wake up and the market's already moved 80 pips, I'm done for the week. And I didn't do anything but sleep in the whole process. But if I miss this opportunity, okay, if I miss it, my eyes go right to the low that formed prior to that run above the opening price when I'm bearish. So I'm going to place a sell stop to get me in. Now, sell stops, generally, you understand them as a protective basis or mechanism to protect your long position. If there is no long position and you place a sell stop, it's going to put you in short. And that's what I'd be expecting to see happen here. So when price drops down, I could be short there. And my stop loss would be above the high of the day. So let's assume for a moment that I missed this opportunity here and I just can't stay up. Something happens, you know, my wife is uh, getting ready to have a baby, and this has happened. <laughs> uh, I had to do, take a trade. So, I, I mean, I, I have to trade, folks, okay? It is what it is, okay? And I had to hear about it on the way to the hospital that day, but nonetheless, <laughs> I, I'm, you know, this is, this is real life stuff here, folks. So, if I miss the opportunity to get in, okay, and, and the Swiss franc is looking to go lower, I'm going to place a sell stop below the swing low right before the rally above the opening price with the expectation that if this order fills, it will place a protective buy stop above the high plus three pips. And then again, same scenario, I would have a take profit of 50 pips, which is a low end of my weekly objective, and that's it. I don't trail my stop. I do not trail stops. I do not have a mechanism that trails my stop loss lower because I don't think it should be done. Okay, um, I teach taking partials is the better way to go and leave your stop loss where you initially put it. Manage the risk from taking partials and then slowly move it down after New York trading starts. Because if you're going to get a big range day, like we see here, you want to trail the stop loss after New York has done its retracement. If we take the conversation back to the utilization of the Asian range, we can see here what's actually happening is that we have a tight narrow consolidation and we're bearish. Now think, we have folks that want to buy on a breakout. They get tripped in with the move above the Asian range high here. So now what are they? They're long. Where's their stop loss going to be at? Right below that low. The market goes right down below there to take their stops. Notice it doesn't just go a little bit. It goes conveniently 10 pips below it. It's going to sweep out anybody that has a stop loss at or just below that low. And using that little tail over here, they think that they're safe. They're not. The real move is running above the Asian range high after the buyers have been put in. Then taken out, driven back up again. Why? Because short sellers that were lucky enough to try to sell short at the top of this channel or trading range, they're making money here. They're not going to be allowed to be profitable. They run on their stops, which would be a buy stop run above these highs. That's where you're looking to be a seller. This is the lowest risk, high probability entry for using the Asian range. If we wait for the Asian range low to be broken, and it retrades back up to it, that's the other entry point using the Asian range. So we can see there's two ways of using this range. Selling above the Asian range high when we're bearish, best scenario, especially if you have the scenario that's been outlined here. Understand the storyline. You have to have a bias on the day. And do not change gears based on all this little movement here. 
you have to stick to what your analysis is calling for. Higher time frame is going to go lower, so we want to be looking for the market to take out the Asian range high. If that happens, we could sell short there. Or the low risk confirmation trade is wait for the Asian range low to break and then trade back up to it, and then we can sell there. Okay, and if it happens to occur during an ICT kill zone, London open or New York open, the probabilities go through the roof in terms of being, well, accurate. And then you can see that unfold in your charts. If you go through the, the charts with this in mind, okay, just put the Asian range on and paint them manually. I know you all want indicators and pop this up and empty for this and empty for that. Physically draw them in. Spend some time in the charts. Get intimate with price action because it's going to teach you a lot more. I had to do this stuff with charts that were, you know, hand drawn. Like I, I had, well, an obsession with printed charts. So I would print out charts and I would do all these things by hand in a ruler and a magic marker and highlighter. That's the stuff I used to do, and that, and I'm convinced that's what made me good at it. Being lazy about this. OK, what you're really saying is, is I don't really have time to really study it. Just give me the lipstick on the chart and then there it is. You will not get the same level of appreciation or understanding if you shortcut it. Draw the levels on as I taught. So by taking the time to draw this out manually and reminding yourself, OK, it may even be worth taking the time to type out a notation you know, in this uh, in this area here to not focus on the movements below the Asian range, okay? Focus primarily on a move above the Asian range high when we're bearish and or if we break below the Asian range after midnight, wait for a retest in the form of a resistance. Now, think about what you're seeing here. If we look at price action like this, if, what, if we don't use the Asian range concept here, as I'm outlining, the question is, is why would this be a selling point? I mean, granted, you know, you can go back to this low here and say, well, that's probably a, um, a reason for it. But would you really look at that after seeing this and then this movement through? You know, without this insight, chances are you're probably not going to see this actual scenario. And that's the difference between understanding tape reading and building context behind price and also sticking with a bias. It's important to know what a trading bias is for any given day. And anyone that tells you don't trade with a bias, they're the ones that are telling you that because they don't know how to do it. I've given many examples on how you can arrive at a daily bias and you're not going to get a daily bias that's accurate every single day. So don't let me paint that picture for you. But I can be in the upper 90s in terms of my probabilities and directional bias. If you can get just 65 to 70 percent accuracy with your with your bias, and then wait for conditions like I'm showing you here, adding time of day, kill zones, daily bias, focusing with the Asian range, we've already looked at power three. It builds the entire model for the daily range, and you are not surprised when certain things happen. In fact, you're anticipating them before they happen, and by seeing day after day after day of doing this, you become much better at, well, interpreting price action and forecasting, which is a skill set that you cannot learn from reading books or watching my videos. You have to spend time in the charts. And if you do that, I promise you, you will glean more from that than anything else that you would ever study. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and if you did, you can find more at TheInnerCircleTrader.com.